the Psalms, scripture read, sung, and quoted for thousands of years. A book of emotionally charged dialogue between God and man, that in the midst of a life of busyness, tension, strife, and chaos, reveals a communion with our Creator. Good morning, Experience Church family. It is so good to be here with you this 4th of July weekend. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're doing something fun with your family. We're so grateful for the freedom that we enjoy in this country, and even more so, we're so grateful for the freedom that we have through Christ. So I'm excited to celebrate that with you today. Like Pastor Jordan said, we are continuing in our Psalms series. So we've been taking a psalm every week from the reading plan and kind of breaking it down together as a family in church. And this week we decided that we might need some catching up. I needed to do a little bit of catching up on my reading plan. So we decided to go back a little bit and hit Psalm 51. So today we'll be preaching out of Psalm 51 in a message that we've titled, A Satisfied Soul. So as we get there, I'd love to give you a little bit of context about what is going on in Psalm 51. This is actually a response to 2 Samuel 12. If you haven't had a chance to read 2 Samuel 12, I'd love for you to go check that out this afternoon. It's a really exciting story. And what's going on is this is King David in Psalm 51. And he is responding to this guy named Nathan, who is a prophet. Basically, Nathan is calling him out because David has been caught in this really difficult and destructive sin that should have disqualified him from being king and walking in the things that God has called him to. See, David was king, and David was in Israel while all the other armies were out fighting battles. And David is walking around, and he notices this beautiful woman named Bathsheba bathing on the roof. And David uses his power to his advantage. Instead of walking in the authority that God has given him, and he uses that to step into sin, he commits adultery with Bathsheba. Not only that, he tries to cover it up. He commands the commander of his army to send Bathsheba's husband to the front lines, essentially murdering him so that he could try to cover everything up. Now, I don't know if David had a press secretary, but let me tell you, David was having a bad day, but his press secretary was having a worse day. I don't know how you clean that up. After you kill a guy, you commit adultery, you're trying to do the whole deal, and you're still king of Israel. I don't think that's going to work very well. So Nathan is calling him out, and this is the response that we get in Psalm 51. And some of us may not be able to relate to David's story in that sort of sin. But I wonder that when we look at this story where David is still somehow satisfied in his relationship with God after this situation that should have disqualified him, I wonder if you and I have ever wanted true satisfaction in our relationship with God, but somehow we were worried that our sin would disqualify us. If that's ever been you, I know it's been me before, this is where we meet David today. And he's going to show us four ways that we can live with a satisfied soul in Psalm 51. So if you'll join me in Psalm 51, verse 1, it says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire faithfulness in the inner parts. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. To have a satisfied soul, David says we first must be emptied through confession. Emptied through confession. See, in verse 1, David says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Confession can happen only because we trust God's character. When David's confronting the sin, the very first thing he says is, have mercy. Why? Because of your great compassion. Not because my apology was really, really good. Not because my sin wasn't actually that bad, so we should just sweep it under the rug and not pay attention. Not because God didn't know what was going on. God knew David's sin, and David was saying, because of your character, I'm going to confess. See, only God is both just and good. Only God is powerful enough to save us from our sin and compassionate enough to do so. Confession can happen because we trust God's character. 
David goes on here in verse 3. He says, I know my transgressions. David knew what he did wrong, right? It wasn't just this general feeling that we sometimes feel like, oh, I could do better. I'm kind of a good person, but I'm not really quite there. David knew exactly what it was that was separating him from God. Exactly what it was that God was displeased with, that God knew was keeping him from relationship with him. And this reminded me of a kind of funny story from growing up. And before I tell it, before you send me an email about how I should have known better, um, please remember I was seven. Have some grace for me, please. I was seven. Okay, cool, cool. So one time, I was seven. For those of you who know me now, you know I love to carry a lot of things at one time. I'm the girl carrying eight grocery bags up the stairs so I don't have to take a second trip. Anybody else in the room? A few of you? Yeah, yeah. So this has always been me. So seven-year-old me was minding my own business in my second grade class, and this kid named Ryan comes up to me, and he asked me to point something out in the room. I don't even remember what it was to this day. It was scarring. And um, so I'm just holding this stuff, and Ryan's asked me to point something out. And I had one finger free in all the things that I was carrying. I had one finger free, so I pointed out the thing in the room that he needed to pay attention to. And all of a sudden, Ryan, like, storms away, goes and gets the teacher. The teacher comes up to me. Ryan comes up to me. And she goes, Meredith, you need to apologize. I was like, for what? I literally didn't know what I did. I was just pointing to something. He asked me to help. I was being helpful and kind. Um, Didn't work. Didn't, you know, she was frustrated with me. She's like, why are you playing dumb right now? Like, you need to apologize for what you did. I was like, my mom told me pointing was rude one time. Like, I'm sorry, maybe that was it. Um, (laughs) Turns out the only finger I had available at the moment to show him the thing in the room was my middle finger. And (laughs) I didn't know what that meant. I was seven, guys. So I'm like just pointing out something in the room, thinking I'm being super helpful. And that confession did nothing for me. I eventually said sorry just so they'd get off my back and I could go on about the day, confused still, but whatever. And that confession didn't do anything because I didn't actually know what it was I was sorry for. And this general feeling of unease isn't going to help us much. But when we can look at our sin because we know we have a compassionate God, that's when we can have the freedom that we find in confession. But if David knew his sin, why does he say this in verse 4? Why does he say, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight? Because I may not be the greatest at math, but if I was, I was telling this story and counting up the people, I think there's about three or four people that David sinned against. So why was it that he said against you only? See, confession reminds us that we are responsible to God before we're responsible to people. This was constantly what David was, uh, what Jesus was correcting in the New Testament with his people. Um, There's a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were experts in the law, and their role was to help the people live in a way that was consistent with the covenant. But too often, they were more concerned with their outward piety than their inner heart posture before God. And so Jesus corrects them in, in Matthew 23. He says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside... They're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs looking beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. The Pharisees were so busy looking right before people that they weren't getting right before God. They would be a beautiful empty vase on the outside, but inside, full of the dirt, full of the sin, full of the pride, and all of the things that God was displeased with. If we're going to be freed by emptying ourselves of confession, it's not just looking out the outside and coming to church on Sunday and looking okay. It's dumping out all these things before a compassionate God and asking for freedom through confession. So to have a satisfied soul, we have to be emptied through confession We also are emptied of ourselves through cleansing. David says this, Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. And I don't know if many of you have seen hyssop. I hadn't seen hyssop, but we have a picture on the screen. If you're from the great state of Texas, this looks a little bit like a Texas blue bonnet, so you can kind of relate to it. But hyssop was used for a specific purpose in Israelite culture. It was for ritual cleansings. They would use it to sprinkle water or blood on a sacrifice. So this wasn't like your ancient shower loofah. It wasn't like something that you grab that you try to clean yourself up before you go to church or before you go to synagogue. This was a a specific type of cleansing done by God. It was representing the fact that God was cleaning his people. 
See, God's cleansing of us is greater than any cleansing we could have on our own. This cleansing that we're talking about that frees us is not us cleaning ourselves up after we confess so that God will love us again. It's us allowing God to cleanse us of our sin in a way that only he can. And we know now that through Jesus, right, we celebrated communion today. Through the blood of Jesus, we are cleansed of our sin. And just like the Israelites used to be cleansed by the sprinkling of blood and sacrifices, Hebrews 9.14 shows us how that happens now. It says, how much more then will the blood of Christ, through the eternal spirit, offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death? See, now that we've dumped out our vase, now that we've gotten rid of all the dirt, I'm still not quite ready to use this. There's still bits of dirt left in the inside. It's still not ready. But through the blood of Jesus, how many of you know that a magic eraser fixes everything? So Jesus is the same way for us. I've never found anything that cleans better than a magic eraser, and I've never experienced a deeper cleansing than the blood of Jesus. Nothing that we could accomplish on our own, but Jesus cleans us. He goes on, one of my favorite things David says in this passage is in verse 9. He says, hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquity. I was a little confused by this passage at first when God said, hide your face. The first thing I thought about was peekaboo. I don't know if there's any parents in the room or any psychology majors. Peekaboo is fun, but how many of you know that about by eight months old, object permanence becomes a thing? And it's like not fun anymore. And they're not entertained. Well, God's the same way, right? This idiom doesn't mean that God is playing peekaboo with our sin. And that, oh, maybe I can sneak it by him on Monday, and God might see it on Tuesday, and I'll feel bad, but we'll just, we'll just go back to hiding our face. I'll just ask God to not pay attention. This peekaboo is not what's happening with our sin. We don't pull a fast one on God with our sin. What this is saying, it's, an, it's a Hebrew idiom. And to hide your face means to not pay attention to, to turn away from, to not have your presence be right there. And so what David is begging God to do, he's, God, because of your great compassion, because you have cleansed me with hyssop and made me whiter than snow, please don't pay attention to my sin. Please don't put your face on it. Remind me, let me walk in the cleansing that you have given me. He says, blot out my iniquity. When God cleanses us, it is as if our sin is no longer on our record. It's not that God didn't know it didn't happen. It's that he knew, he saw it, and as we confessed, he said, I'm going to cleanse you. And my eyes are not going to be staring at that sin. My eyes are going to be staring at you being whiter than snow because of the blood of Jesus. So now we've got an empty and clean vase. But I don't know about you. I really hope that if you have a vase at your house that's empty and clean, you do something with it, right? You don't just sit it up on a shelf. And what we're about to see in this next part of Psalm 51, as Spencer comes up, is that God is the same way with us. You don't want to just sit empty and clean on the shelf. He has more for us. I don't know about y'all. Meredith was preaching so good, I almost forgot that I was up next. (laughs) That's you. Um, I want to jump right into uh, the latter half of this psalm, picking up in verse 10. It says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take uh, your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And so as David's praying here, he he not only models this idea of emptying ourselves of ourselves onto God and, and, and in front of him, he not only models that and clean, you know, the, the, the cleansing that comes from Jesus, uh, but how many of you know that God also desires uh, to fill us with himself, right? That it's not only this idea that we empty uh, ourselves of ourself, but that the promise of God is that he actually wants to create some things in us. That the promise of God is that he actually wants to do a work in our hearts that we can't do in and of ourselves, and so uh, the first thing that I see in the scripture, I'm going to give you a couple things um, that, uh, that I see in the scripture that God creates in us. And the first one is that he creates a pure heart. He creates a pure heart. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now this word create here uh, means, in the Hebrew it means to make or to call into existence. 
Uh, if you've read Genesis chapter 1, uh, God is on a tangent of creating. He is creating everything that we see, right? And in verse 1, he says, uh, for God, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He's, he's, he's speaking and he's calling these things into existence. He, he calls the sea and the land into existence. He calls animals. He calls Chick-fil-A into existence. Come on. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. That's not in Genesis chapter 1. Um, and uh, it should be. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and, and then at the end, he, he creates us. He creates human beings. In verse 27, it says, so God created mankind in his own image. So God is speaking and he is creating new things. And it's the same word that David uses here whenever he says, create in me a pure heart. AKA meaning, God, I need you to do a new thing in me. I need you to, I need you to give me a new heart. I need you to give me a pure heart. David doesn't ask God to give him a better heart. He, get, he asks God to give him a new heart. I used to have this truck, and uh, it was an old truck. It, it had like 300,000 miles on it, um, and we used to call it Old Faithful. Not because it was faithful to get you to where you were going, uh, but because it was faithful to be right where you left it. Come on, somebody. Um, broken down on the side of the road, praise God. Uh, and so uh, every time I brought it into the mechanic, though, man, he would come back to me, and you know how they'll come back to you, and they're like, $600 for a, for a fluid change and an oil change. And you're like, how did we get here in this moment? And so, um, you know, and, and, but he would say the same words almost every single time. He would say, we, we got to do this. We got to fix this. We got to patch this so that we can get you to where you're trying to go. We gotta, we gotta patch this in your truck so that we can get you running, so that you can get to where you're trying to go. And I was thinking about this message and how David asked God to create in him a new heart. And I, I, I thought about how this idea has kind of leaked into the church. We come to church and we're like, man, I just gotta get patched up so I can get to where I'm trying to go. I gotta, I gotta get patched up so I can be a better person. I gotta get patched up so I can fall in line and please all of these people, and the reality of it is, is that not all of those things are necessarily bad. It's just not the intent of why Jesus came, died, and rose again. He didn't come to, to make us better people. He came to, to make dead people alive. Ephesians chapter 2 says, but because of his great love for us, come on, God who is rich in mercy. Aren't you glad that God is rich in mercy to us today? He made us alive with Christ, alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, for it is by grace that you have been saved. See, Jesus, he came to, to make us alive in Christ. So the only way for God to give us a pure heart is if he gives us a new heart through his salvation. Amen? And so God, he begins to see if I can do this. He begins to not only after we pour ourselves out, after he cleanses us with the blood, but he begins to actually fill us with himself. He, he, he fills us with a pure heart. The second thing here that I see from David is that David knew that he needed the Holy Spirit. He says uh, right here in, in verse 11, he says, do not cast me from your presence, or take me, uh, take your Holy Spirit from me. So not only does God give us a new heart, He fills us with His presence. And how many of you know that we can't do anything without the Holy Spirit? We, we, we cannot do anything. We cannot be who God's called us to be. We cannot go where God's called us to go, and we cannot be who God has called us to be without the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is talking about this Holy Spirit in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 to his disciples, and he says it like this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and all of Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now notice, the promise of the Holy Spirit when we're filled with, this, with the presence of God is that we receive power. But how many of you know that we don't just receive power from God to go and further our own agendas? We don't just receive power from God to, to go get the dream job or to fill up the bank account. 
right? We, we receive power to go and be witnesses to the ends of the earth. So God not only fills us with his presence, he gives us power in order to go and accomplish the purpose of God, which is to go and expand his glory on all of the earth. And David knew this. And so he says, he says, God, please don't take your presence from me. I can't do what I need to do without your presence. And so he says, God, would you fill me? Would you fill me with your presence? And that's what God does for us. The third thing is that God restores joy to David. It says in uh, verse 12, it says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now notice David doesn't say, Restore to me salvation. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Meaning that David didn't lose his right standing with God because of his decisions, but that he had lost the joy that came with his salvation because of his decisions. Right? And we see this in our own life, right? Like uh, Sometimes life can find us, circumstances can find us, or we can make decisions in life that make us lose the joy that God desires for us to live with. I've defined joy today uh, as uh, it's not happiness because of our surroundings, but it's contentment outside of our circumstances. Meaning this, that regardless of what I'm facing, regardless of whatever's in front of me, I'm content because my joy comes from a God who is unchanging, although my circumstances may be shaky, He is not. Right? He, he gives us joy, which is contentment. I, uh, I had the privilege of going uh, to Wild Adventures uh, with our youth group uh, this past week. Um, and anybody ever, maybe misplaced is a better word than lost. Has anybody ever misplaced uh, something that you deeply care about? Your wallet, come on, anybody in the room, your keys, uh, anybody constantly misplacing um, things. And so uh, anybody, parents, anybody ever misplaced a child? Come on, you, you won't... <laughs> You, 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 you didn't lose them because you can't lose something if you found them, right? You just misplaced them for a moment in time, okay? Come on. I, listen, we're all, we're all, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, okay? Um, and so, anyways, we're going to eat at Wild Adventures. We've got a lot of students that we're, that we're, we're accountable to. And two of the groups were meeting at one place for lunch. Because one, one, one group wanted chicken tenders, and then the other group wanted barbecue. And so we're meeting at the barbecue place. One group comes. They meet us at the barbecue place. We sit down. One of the leaders looks at me wide-eyed and says, where's Buddy? I look back at them, and I said, I don't know. Where's Buddy? And they said, I don't know where Buddy is. He's not here. And so we do what any good youth leaders would do uh, that misplace something important. Uh, we, we go, we get up, and we start looking. And I can't stress enough that the timeline between whenever uh, we realized, whenever we, you know, when we actually found Buddy uh, was like two minutes, okay? So just forgive us. Um, and so anyways, we found Buddy, and uh, he's sitting by the lake. Just, I mean, in his own world, in paradise, eating chicken tenders. And how many parents in the room, you know how you're approaching. Buddy, where have you been? I was, I was, more, I was more gentle, and I said, buddy, where have you been? <laughs> buddy, where have you been? Right? And he looks up, me, up at me with these eyes, and he's like, he's like, I just had to take a break. I'm like, buddy, from what? He said, I just got so tired carrying all my chicken tenders and my fries and my ketchup and my Sprite, and it just got to be too much. I had to take a break. I just sat there and laughed, and I said, buddy, get, get to the barbecue, please. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right, but how many of you know that sometimes life can make us feel like buddy? It's just too much. We can find ourselves in circumstances sometimes and it finds us, and we're just like, you know, I just got to sit down, man. I just, I just got to isolate myself from the group for a moment so that I can rest. And although the first equation to this is emptying ourselves of God, I mean of ourselves, the, the first part of this equation that David shows us is emptying ourselves, but we don't stay there. 
Right? David's like, I need your joy. I need you to pour out your joy into my life. I don't want to just sit in my sorrow because of my mistakes. I need your joy that's everlasting. And then the fourth thing, he grants, he says, will you grant me a willing spirit to sustain me? I'm closing. He says, will you grant me a willing spirit? It's, it's what God gives us. It's, this uh, is a willing spirit. And uh, that word there, that word willing there means ready. That word willing there means ready. And I started thinking about David desired and asked God for joy, which is contentment in the present. Contentment regardless of my circumstances. And then he asked God, would you give me a willing spirit? Will you give me a ready spirit? Because I know that you've got things planned for my life. The question becomes, am I ready? The question becomes, am I willing to go and be where you've called me to be? And so David knew he not only needs joy, but he also needs a, a willingness and a readiness to go and be who God has called him to be. And so the question for us today is, are we joyfully content right where we are, regardless of the job, regardless of the stage of life, regardless of what life is facing? And are we preparing for what is to come? Because can I just encourage you, church? God has called you for more than where you're at right now. God has called you for more than where you're at right now. And more doesn't always look like what, we're, what, what, what we think. It doesn't always look like more in the bank account or a different job. It looks like more of his glory being made known in this earth. And that's what God is calling us as a church. But are we ready to go? And are we willing? So... God begins to fill David with this willing spirit, joy, Holy Spirit, all of these great things until he's filled all the way up to the brim. And the last thing that David shows us in these Psalms is in verse 13. He says, after all of this, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Can I give you the last piece that God gives us in this psalm? He not only desires to, uh, for us to confess, He not only desires for us uh, to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, He not only desires to create some incredible things in our hearts and in our lives, but He also wants to give us a calling. He says, then I will go and teach transgressors your ways. Then, once I have emptied myself of myself, and you have cleansed me, and you have filled me up with you, then I will go and tell of your goodness. Psalms chapter 23 and verse, uh, and, and verse 5 says, uh, it says, uh, I, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And so God doesn't just fill us with himself for us. He also desires for that joy that he gave you to overflow to your workplace, to overflow into your family, to overflow into your kids' lives, to overflow into our community. Come on, somebody, to overflow into Tallahassee, to overflow until, until the whole world knows of his goodness. The very joy and the very willingness, the very things that he gives us, he now calls us to go and overflow into others. And so, I don't know where you find yourself today. I, I know that I need all of these components in my life today. Amen? And so I want to just pray for us for a moment and ask the Lord to meet us right where we're at, regardless of what life is facing us with, that we would have boldness to go before Him today. Lord, thank you.